Okay, so let's start this morning's session. Good morning, everyone. Morning, once again. Good morning. Morning, morning. morning. You're awake. Nice to see. Well, on behalf of the Austel company and the entire team behind Austel, and of course the lecturers today, myself, Professor Peter Moy and Professor Daniel Busser, we would like to wish you a very warm welcome to this Austel Scientific Symposium. The first slide. And the topic of my talk for today. Uh, I'm going to present to you a little bit about the basics behind the Austel technique. Uh, and I will also apply it to some ideas about immediate loading in the single tooth implant situation. Now, ISQ and resonance frequency analysis is not something new. It's a technique that has been used for many, many years in different kinds of industries. Uh, and now it has been sort of applied into dental implant dentistry for some years. Uh, what we do is more or less is that we attach a smart peg, called a smart peg, um, and we'll talk about how this sort of transfers itself into a reading, meaning ISQ. Now, a very important statement here, of course, is that the technique itself is objective. Uh, meaning also, of course, that it's non-invasive. So, of course, we are comparing it to older, let's say, clinical values as torque, percussion, uh, the feeling that you have as an implant surgeon. Uh, the question, of course, that I'm asking myself, being slightly younger, perhaps, is how do I gain confidence taking sort of the right decisions when I do my implant treatments? Well, of course, I know the technique itself has a lot of scientific data behind it. Uh, and I question, of course, that those, as I mentioned, older values, for example, insulation torque, how does that apply to me when I take my decisions? Is that a value that really determines where I go in my implant treatment? Well, I like this article written by Michael Norton because it sort of emphasizes this idea of maybe that we're focusing a little bit too much on torque, because we all know it's, it's, it's a static data. It's something that we apply when we place the implant, but it doesn't really tell us anything about the biology of the implant and the osseous integration of the implant. So that's an important statement. Now, how we actually measure then, well, we attach a smart peg uh, to the implant, and by means of this instrument, we are sending a magnetic pulse, creating a vibration, which again comes back to the instrument, and we measure the frequency of that, and also transfer it to an ISQ value. And what you see here on the right-hand side is the newest generation of the Ostel technique, so the Ostel IDX. And what it also says is that the more stable the implant, the higher the ISQ value. Now, the actual values we'll be discussing more in detail and also during Peter's uh, lecture. Now, what has been seen the latest years in research is that there is a very strong correlation to micromobility. So, of course, comparing micromobility to torque, which, of course, then is resistant to shear force, it's very difficult to repeat that, of course. So, measuring osseointegration, trying to unscrew the implant is not something that you're doing. Now, what we're measuring here and here is lateral micromobility, so it has a strong correlation. And again, further studies emphasizing the same thing. So we're sort of considering the dynamic sort of process of osseointegration, really looking at it as a biological process that is going on, meaning that we can take several values and compare those over time, instead of just focusing on just the one value of torque. Now, ISQ and micromobility itself has, as you see in this graph, a non linear correlation. So what we emphasize here is that you see from 60 to 70, that jump in 60 to 70 of ISQ, you have a decrease in 50% of micromobility. So many times when you see studies emphasizing and focusing on the technique of resonance frequency analysis, you see 70 as a sort of a break of value. It's not the only value, but it seems to be that something is happening between 60 and 70, which is quite 
important for us when we measure uh, our values. And of course, measuring values has a great importance because you know there are a lot of demands from patients. Uh, you have the same sort of uh, decisions that you have to take every day. And we don't only have sort of those loading concepts, we also have those compromised patients, more difficult clinical situations, osteoporotic patients, diabetic patients, etc. Uh, and of course, in that aspect, there is an increased need for, for diagnosing those specific clinical uh, demanding situations. So if we take just a standard case, and this is sort of more or less how I gather up data when I do my clinical everyday work. So this being a patient that comes to the clinic with a failing bridge on the right-hand side maxilla, also left-hand side mandible. But we're focusing on the right-hand side maxilla at this moment, where there's a bridge that's going to fail and we have to extract a tooth. And what I do normally then is that to collect as much data as possible. So modern techniques, of course, enables us to bring up a lot of data surrounding the patient. So we're adding different sets of data, if you may. And that means more or less that we can turn these on and off. We can go into specific softwares, guiding more or less our prosthetic planning. So of course, it's prosthetically driven implant dentistry. Uh, the problem that we're seeing here is that yes, we have some values on the right-hand side. We're seeing uh, the bone itself in terms of perpendicular re-slices. We have some ideas about Hounsfield units. But really, what is the value and what is the stability of the implant at the time of surgery when replacing those two implants? That's the real question. And to measure that, as I mentioned, we have to apply the Ostel technique. So measuring ISQ and the, on this patient, what we're doing is that we're attaching the smart peg and we're measuring it from two different angles. So we measure at one angle at the top and then we switch 90 degree. The reason for this is that the instrument is going to give you the highest and the lowest value. Now, of course, the lowest value would be, if it's very low, that could be a warning sign guiding you then in the clinical decision. So if you check this patient, where we place the implant here with a flapless surgery, as you see on the left-hand side. What we have is that we have an implant in the first position with quite a high ISQ value. Now, the second implant, more distal, more in the area where we extracted the tooth, has a lower ISQ value. So, of course, this tells me I'm not going to load that implant. So we're not going to do an early loading or immediate loading. So we're waiting for osteointegration, waiting for healing. Now, validating after a number of weeks, where are we in terms of a biological process? Where are we in terms of secondary stability? Of course, then we make a second measurement, and now all of a sudden we see that we have a big jump in ISQ, which of course tells me that, okay, if I'm attaching an abutment at this time, having 25 Newton centimeters of torque at that time, and starting to plan the definitive restoration, I have some sort of confidence taking that decision. Now, is there an absolute number then? Well, we're going to talk about this a lot of times today. There is no absolute number. What we're seeing is that if we have a very high ISQ value, that implant is less likely to have a very low value during the healing process. Now, you saw with a very low value and the previous patient, that is more likely during the healing to rise. So what we're looking for is that we're looking for those, of course, implants that has very low values or all of a sudden shows very low values. Those are signs of taking actions, of course. So those are the important implants as well, to avoid mistakes. So at this patient, then, we finished up the prosthetic treatment, a three-unit screw-retained bridge, something that is quite common where I'm coming from. Now, if we stretch, then, the borderline a little bit, and we talk about that, say, single implant situation, uh, recent years, what we are trying to do is to connect even more, let's say, the dimensions of our patients. So in those, those clinical situations where we have that single identical space, we're actually adding all kinds of data surrounding the patient. And also enabling different types of softwares 
connecting to each other. And that means more or less that we can walk through an entire treatment planning process in a fully digital way. So we're giving all kinds of information into the uh, planning software and we're constructing a surgical guide and a definitive final CAD CAM restoration before the time of surgery. So that was the focus. Can we actually connect those dots and control that process in an effic efficient way? So a couple of cases then. This being a single implant case, and you see the left-hand uh, central incisor. So this is something that has been referred to the clinic. Patient has a failing root, and it has been restored temporarily with a composite crown by the referring dentist. And it's a very interesting sort of lateral root filling technique. They try to fix uh, cracks of the root, um, but of course the tooth itself is failing, so we're going to replace it with a single implant. Now patient here, this is a famous Swedish person, I'm not going to say the name, but she is more or less telling me that, you know, Marcus, I know that you can perform this and you can give me an immediate restoration the day of surgery because I'm not going to have something that is removable because I can't control my work. I need a tooth here. So is there a way to manage this? So this was an interesting case to sort of try out this concept. So what we're doing then, that we're walking from the time of extraction, we're placing the implant by means of a guide, and we are immediately loading that implant. So, of course, at that stage, what are we doing? Yes, we're drilling through a guide. Now, problem in quote, doing guided surgery, you lose tactility. You lose the sense of when you're drilling through that type of instruments. And talking about torque, you have a squeeze fit between components. So I gain prosthetic values, I have an implant that is placed in a perfect angulation position, but I have no sense really of a primary stability or slash torque when I install the implant. So I have to measure by means of ISQ what type of implant, what type of decision should I take. So we're aiming of course for immediate loading here, and this is a nice value. So it's a high value of ISQ. So that gives me the confidence of course to go further with the patient. Second patient, similar situation, left hand central incisor. Now this is a patient that has a period disease and she has a tooth that is beyond rescue and also in a crown that is sort of non-aesthetic on the lateral incisor. So we do the same type of planning really. We evaluate the situation and we aim for having something installed for the patient at time of surgery. So what we're doing here in terms of shift of techniques is that, of course, previously, if I loaded immediately these kind of patients, we had a temporary abutment, and we're either subtracting or adding acrylic. We're sort of maturing the soft tissue situation during the healing phase, but really, I have to do a lot of manual work. I'm trusting upon my skill, really, to shape the composite. Now, what we're doing here is that no acrylic really is facing the soft tissue. So here we have either zirconia or titanium at the time of extraction, at the time of surgery. And that is facing the soft tissue at this point. And of course, by means of these modern softwares, if I have a tooth that really tells me the rate of emergence profile, it tells me mother nature shape, this is what I can copy, more or less. So at time of surgery, we have something that looks exactly like a tooth. So 10 weeks down the road, we still have a gain of ISQ. So of course I have the confidence of when to start the definitive restoration. And what we're seeing in terms of the tissues then, this being the first case, is that we have something that looks really nice because of this way of applying those modern materials. And this being the second patient, what you can see here, that this really looks exactly like the patient's tooth. So a number of weeks down the road, we have a very, very nice situation to continue with our definitive restoration. So of course the trick here, the next step for me would be if I actually have something that shapes the soft tissue, creates that type of profile, really would I like to remove it or would I just keep it in place? 
I could keep just the one abutment. Maybe you know, I will take it off, I will measure ice Q, but I can more or less put it back and switch the temporary crown into the definitive one. So that would be the last sort of knot, I think, to sort of solve. So here we see the first case then. So this is two years down the road. Uh, and we have something that I believe is, is quite stable, of course. Uh, and this is a technique of work compared to other types of more advanced techniques where you do several augmentation procedures or several surgeries. So this is something, of course, for the patient that is really, really efficient. Now, the second patient, quite demanding case, really. We have that type of periodontal disease. You have that type of non-aesthetic tooth, also on the left uh, lateral incisor. And we have the initial situation looking like this still with the same type of sort of technique, applied protocol, this is more or less what we gain. And of course, what we see when you put on a filter here with modern CAD CAM techniques is also that we're cutting away time and being even more efficient also making this definitive restoration. So the left-hand side is actually a CAD CAM produced, more or less full anatomical crown with 10 to 20% cutback. So this is what is, of course, available with the modern CAD CAM softwares. And of course, I have to show you a picture from the side because, yes, I know I will lose horizontal dimension. But this is a stable tissue now. And we have protected the tissue, if you may, by having material at time of surgery, really facing that tissue, shaping that tissue from the point of extraction. And also here we have the final x-ray. So this is 50 months uh, post-operative. And of course, the patient is very, very happy. So a similar situation as the first patient, really looking for that type of immediate restoration. And making that efficient by means of using those systems is, to me, is, is extremely important in my clinic. So that is sort of the basis of the technique. It's sort of an introduction into what you can do in terms of measuring ISQ in those immediate extraction implant placement situations. So really, where do we go from here then? Well, I would like to make a comparison of ISQ with another known technique. And now we're going to sort of exercise a little bit. So you wake up. Now we're going to do it non-digital. So you're going to raise hands. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you in the audience are using, have used a GPS system in a car or on a bicycle? Yeah, so everyone more or less. Yeah. And what is the GPS doing? It's telling you where you are at the moment, right? But it's also telling you where you're going. So those are two very important things. Same thing in implant dentistry. So ISQ really is the GPS for your dental implants. It does actually tell you the current situation, and you also follow the development of those implants over time. So that's a very, very important statement. 